Morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and mark open to Revelation 6 and also in the book of Zechariah. We're going to be back and forth between those two books this morning. But before we begin, you may have heard of a tragedy that happened this weekend up in Buffalo where a man drove over 200 miles to do great acts of violence against other human beings. And as I was reading the report, I'm reading some of the things that are coming out, why the reasons why this, this individual would drive all this way to do what he did, to hear his family talk about it, to hear people who knew him talk about it. And it was kind of a shock to just about everybody. You know, there are times where a person comes and does something like that, and everyone kind of goes, yeah, I, I can see that person doing that. And there are times where you just you don't know where some of these, this hatred and these acts of violence stem from. And we know, as Christians, that sin, right? We allow sin to corrupt us, to change us, and if it becomes unchecked, what can happen with sin? It gets worse and worse and worse. And when you live in a world where sin is propped up, right? Where sin is perpetuated, where we have solutions to these problems, but these solutions are nowhere near adequate, right, to solve the hatred. And as I was thinking about this lesson, because this lesson has a lot to do with, in Revelation chapter 6, right, the, the saints under the altar crying out, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how long will you allow these things to happen? And there's many times, I think I've heard it in prayers, right? How many times have you heard it in prayers where someone will pray something to the nature of, Lord, how long will you allow this country and this world to continue going the way that it's going. But I want us to think about that for a moment because we live in a world where we think usually the time period that we live in is the worst it's ever been. I'm tell you, if you're any if you study history at all, this is by far not the worst time period to have ever lived in, even with the acts of violence that happen today, even with the world, the war going on in Ukraine, one thing that you see is there's nothing new under the sun. The world has been in violence. The world has had evil, you know, perpetuate daily, right? And um, are there times of ebbs and flows where some years it seems better, depending on where you live in the world? Right? We look 50 years ago in this country and we think, wow, what a time of peace. But go over to India. Go over to you know, Afghanistan 50 years ago. Were there peace over there? So the world has kind of been in this sense of chaos. And so what we're going to see this morning in Revelation chapter 6 and 7 is that the world is in chaos. We have started with chapter 4 and chapter 5. And we have seen the throne room of God, right? The throne room where God is sitting on his throne and the beings in heaven, what are they doing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the lamb that was worthy to be slain. In the midst of all of this, who reigns supreme? And that was kind of the topic of our lesson last week. But now this week, the, the, the lamb, oops, <clears throat> the lamb is about to open the scroll. Remember that John looked out and he saw this scroll in the right hand of God sitting on the throne and he asked who is worthy to open the scroll and nobody on heaven, nobody in heaven, nobody on earth, nobody underneath the earth, right, was worthy besides the lion of Judah who was the Lamb of God. And so now he's going to open up the scroll. And in these first four seals that are unlocked and broken, there are these what sometimes is called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? right at the end of the world, there's going to be these four horsemen. If you've ever watched any kind of um, apocalyptic movie or TV series, What's one of the first signs, right? The four horsemen are coming. And normally, these four horsemen are depicted as servants of who? Servants of Satan. Servants of evil. And actually, when you actually read the text, 
First, who's the one who holds the scroll? God, right? Jesus, Jesus, who is God, the Lamb, is the one opening these seals, and it's one of the heavenly beings that are calling each of these horsemen to say what? To say, come. And each horse, you know, color represents the, the catastrophes or the disasters that are falling, but I want, following it, but I want you to turn your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 1 with me for a moment this morning. And I want you to see that this, these symbols of horsemen, these colors are nothing new for the book, for the Bible, right? It's nothing specific for the book of Revelation. It's nothing end of time language. It's really just judgment language. You see in the book of Zechariah, who is Zechariah writing to? Zechariah is writing to Jews who have returned from their 70 years of captivity. And he's trying to remind them what they've gone through to encourage them to continue building the temple. And so here's what he says in Zechariah chapter 1. Look at verse 8. And it says, I saw in the night and behold a man... Riding on a red horse, he was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. So we got four horses. And then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And in Zechariah chapter 6, you will see these same four horse, horses, but are carrying chariots with them now. Their job, once again, is to patrol the earth. And so in Revelation chapter 6, when these four horsemen are sent out, first, who is in control of these horsemen? God is in control. Who is the one who sends them out? God sends them out. And they will only do what God has designed them to do. And in Zechariah, these horsemen eventually are being sent out, and the things that happen are not a judgment on the whole world. They're a judgment on God's people. And when they judge God's people, they are meant to purify God's people. Remember back in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? God is preparing them. Jesus wrote letters to the seven churches and said, you are not ready for the coming trials. So what does God do? What does God send to purify and to prepare his people or to get them to repent and to turn back? Right? You look in books like Amos where he says, I sent you plagues. I sent you famine. Right? I sent you wars. I sent you all these, you know, catastrophes, famine to try to get you to repent. And when you read what these four horsemen are doing, the people who are being persecuted, as we're going to see, are Christians. The people who are being put through what these four horsemen are doing are the children of God. Okay? Wrath will come for the rest of the world. Wrath will come and judgment will come on those who are doing this to God's people. But right now, it seems as if God is using these trials, what they are going through, to purify them as a people. Okay? So same, same stuff in Zechariah. Ezekiel 14 uses very simil similar language where God uses pestilence and wild beasts and all of these things to try to punish, prepare, but always it's to purify, right? When God disciplines, right? Hebrews chapter 12 tells us what? That God disciplines those whom he loves. And what God wants his church to be is a purified people so when times do get hard and persecution does come, they can be found what? They can be found worthy and they can be found righteous. Well, as we continue and open up these scrolls, look in Revelation chapter 6. I'm not going to read all the horses and what all they do. By the way, I have an opinion on the seven seals, the seven bowls, and the seven trumpets, okay? Okay that they're all a period, 
that are all the same thing, talking about the same thing in different ways, in different periods of seven. I don't believe one horseman sent out, then another horseman, then another. They're being sent out kind of at the same time. All this stuff is happening at the same time. But there's a sequence when you're looking at apocalyptic language that builds and builds and builds. And a lot of times it's even over-exaggeratory. You'll see one-third of the earth being burned up. Well, there's no time in history where we saw one-third of the earth literally being burned up, right? John wrote this in Revelation chapter 1. He says, I'm writing to you in what? Signs and symbols so that those who read it may be blessed if you listen and take heed. So God is trying to bless his people through these visions and he's letting them know that there are dark times coming and there are already some things that have happened watch look at verse 9 he says when he opened the fifth seal i saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of god and for the witness they had borne they cried out with a loud voice O sovereign lord holy and true how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Flip back over to Zechariah with me for a moment. Chapter 1. Look at verse 12 of Zechariah chapter 1. The, the saints under the altar are crying out what? How long, O Lord? Look at verse 12. And this is following horsemen. Right, following these horsemen that are patrolling the earth and are doing the will of God. Look at verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on whom? On Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which whom you have been angry these 70 years. And so you see a very similar, right? Remember, the book of Revelation over 400 quotations or references are found from the Old Testament. And when you see these Old Testament images, you've got to go back and you've got to look at them and then compare them and see what is John, what is Jesus trying to reveal to John that he is sharing with these seven churches. Horsemen represent God patrolling the earth, disciplining his people, and there, it is during a time when God's people are not at rest, where God's people are at a time where God is not showing mercy on them if you were to look from the outside in, right? Seventy years of captivity, the Jews were sent out of the promised land into Babylon. God must not be with them, right? That's the appearance. Well, when you read the rest of the Bible, God was always with them, right? He went with them to Ezekiel. He told them, I will be with you in exile. God is always there. But when will he return them? That becomes the question. Go over to Zechariah chapter 6 with me. Let's look at this other time where these horsemen are mentioned. So in the first eight verses, it talks about these horses being sent out again. Look at verse 9. And it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, Take from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go to the same day the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. So he's talking to exiles. He's bringing exiles. He says, Take from them the silver and gold, and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehazadak, the high priest. And they say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. So what you're finding is after these horsemen, you're finding theme of exile, but then what are you going to see after exile? Salvation from God. Go back to Revelation chapter 6 with me. Look at verse 11. Then they were each given what? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The church 
is going through a great trial in the book of Revelation, whatever it may be, okay? Different people have different opinions when it was written, what it was written about, but we know for sure that it was written to Christians in the first century who were going through something real and something that they had to know, something they had to heed, and something they had the warnings to them to help them go through what they were about to go through. Okay? So whatever I'm not here to tell you what it is, because really the trial and tribulation has looked different throughout the years of Christianity, hasn't it? Go to any period in history, and you could look at Christians being persecuted, and will these principles ever change? Will not saints always be crying out to God to rescue His people? Should we ever stop praying? Should we ever stop praying, whether we are alive or seemingly, even when we are dead, that when the church is going through trial and tribulation, that we are always going on behalf of God, God, rescue your people. How long, O oh Lord? How many Christians in the Ukraine are being killed and murdered? How many Christians in other countries go over to China and India in the Middle East who are, you know, ones that don't make the big headline news all the time, who are being beheaded or captured or imprisoned or beaten, whatever it may be? Who knows what may come to this country and what we may have to go through? What do we never stop doing as fellow Christians? We pray for one another. Are we not always, whether living or dead, under the altar of God? Right? As we read in Revelation chapter 5, our prayers are what go up to the altar and fill that basin, and these angels are going to throw this basin down so that the prayers of the saints may bring wrath. And we're going to get there in Revelation chapter 8 as well. But we never stop praying. And God has promised rest. I am in control. God says there is a certain number of people that when the blood of the saints hit this number, whatever that number may be, God says it will be no more and I will bring it to an end but rest a little while longer. Does God always promise to bring us out of trials immediately? Will it not sometimes feel like eternity? Right? And there are times where it passes generations. It passes generations. You think about 70 years in captivity. And Israelites going, God, when is this going to end? Right? There are people who went in captivity, who died in captivity, and never saw the return. And yet, God was still faithful to his promise. I worry sometimes that we put a lot of faith. And what I mean by faith is we put a lot of confidence in the powers of this world to really bring serious harm to Jesus' church. I'm going to tell you right now. First and foremost, I think we need to be more worried about what persecution will God himself bring on the church. Right? Because we're right here, right now. This is coming from the throne. This is coming from the call of God to come and sending these horsemen out on God's own people. Why? Because in some way and somehow, they are not ready. They are not obeying. They are not following. They have not been made pure. We, we read all the problems, right, in the seven churches, all things they're struggling with. God says, get ready or I'm going to get you ready. And a lot of times we want to blame our presidents. We want to blame our city councilmen. We want to blame, you know, businesses. We want to blame media. Maybe, maybe it's the Lord trying to wake us up. Wake us up to 
What does real Christianity look like? If you were to strip it down to its bare bones, right? Imagine if you lived in a world where you were persecuted for your faith and you had to live out what bare minimum, really, what Christianity was stripped down to, what would it look like? We've made Christianity a one day a week religion, not even one day. Sometimes it's two hours. I can give God two hours, right? And sometimes even then, man, that's real hard. Sunday's my day off. I don't want to get up. I, I don't want to go for an hour. I got things to do. I got places to be. And yet, there have been times in history where Christians were willing to be burned at Nero's dinner parties, to be candles Right? That's what they call Roman candles, where Christians being tied on stakes, lit on fire for Nero's dinner parties because they would not give up their faith. What is true? What does true trial really look like? And what does it do for the Christian? Well, if you keep reading, verse 12. He opens the sixth seal, and he says, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars, the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree shreds its winter fruit. When shaken by a gale, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones, once again, if this is literal, if all the mountains are gone, and all the land is gone, and all the islands are gone, and the stars are gone, and the sun is gone, are there still going to be kings left on earth? No. This is day of the Lord judgment. Go read Isaiah 2. Go read Joel 2. Go read the book of Daniel. This is talking about a judgment on all of the earth. The day of the Lord is a judgment of God on all people. It says, The kings of the earth, the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks from the mountains. Here's the question. Here's the thing we have to remind ourselves as Christians. If God actually came as an enemy against any national power, what would they do if God actually came after them in his full might and power? It says every king, every ruler, every authority, what would they go do? It says they'd go hide in caves under rocks. There is, you know, people talk a big game. But when God actually displays his power and majesty, there will be nobody standing. When Jesus comes, what do we know? Every knee will what? Every knee will bow. There will be no high-handed, you know, people left standing. They will all be subject to the glory of the king. And our question is that we have to ask ourselves as Christians... Do we subject ourselves to him here and now without having to witness his true display of wrath and judgment? Is the lamb that was slain, his grace and mercy, enough to get us to bow before him? God wants you to bow through mercy, right? He wants every knee to bow because he sent his only son to die for the whole world and that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. That's the way God wants every knee to bow. But one day, every knee will bow whether they like it or not. And so, he asked this question. Verse 16, it says, Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide from us the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They're asking to be crushed by rocks. That would be better than to face the judgment of the Lamb. In verse 17, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And really, that's the question I want to ask this morning. That's what's going to be the rest. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 7. Who can stand. We're going to have this same image. Remember back in Revelation chapter 5 when John or John, yeah, he sees that nobody is worthy. Nobody is worthy to open 
And what do they say to him? Do not be afraid. The lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what he hears. But when he turns, what does he see? He sees a lamb. You're going to have this same imagery here. First, watch this. Look, at, after I saw this, the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, most likely your four horsemen are probably also angels, angelic beings described as horsemen. There's four. You're going to see this over and over and over again. Holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind may blow on the earth or sea against any tree. So there's a period of rest God's going to give for whom? Watch. Then I saw another angel stand ascending and rising on the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea. He says, do not harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And it's going to go and describe that number, right? Then I heard 12,000 from this tribe. And I heard 12,000 from this tribe. And I heard 12,000 from this tribe. To the point where you get to the, right, that 144,000. Look at verse 9. He hears the 12,000. He hears them being numbered. But what does he actually see? After this, I looked and behold a great multitude. No one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Remember that palm branch scene? When's the last time you saw that palm branch scene? Remember when Jesus rides in on Jerusalem on a donkey? What do all the people do? They lay palm trees before him. But what do they do a couple days later? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now all those who yelled crucify him, and after Jesus have, has died, but those who have had faith in the lamb, now they're laying down palm trees. And when you see the resurrected Jesus, are you ever going to turn around and say crucify that figure? He's already been slain, right? Well, how has John seen him? The lamb who has been what? Who has been slain. Go back to Zechariah chapter 1 with me. Look at verse 16. Remember, the angel is asked, How long, O Lord, will you not show mercy on Jerusalem? Here's what God says. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And the measuring, the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord. My city shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord again will comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. After every period when God brings wrath on his people, what does he want following it? He wants that remnant, purified people to come out and to overflow and to make, you know, to the point where the city, you can't even measure it, right? It's so big and it's so large. Go to Zechariah chapter 6. We have this same thing happening. It says, Behold the man whose name is the branch, verse 12. For he shall branch out from this place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Look at verse 13. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne and there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Who do we know is talking about here? Who do we know is the branch from David? Who do we know who's building the temple of God? Who do we know who's going to be the king sitting over all of the kingdom? It's Jesus. Who's pictured in Revelation chapter 6 as everybody who's bowing down and laying palm branches before? Before the Lamb. Look at this next verse, verse 14. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Halem, to Bajiah, to Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And look at verse 15. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. You shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. This shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord. So who will stand? Who can stand? Who is God going to stop all of this trial and tribulation? He says literally to pause all of persecution until he seals his saints. 
Go back to Revelation chapter 7. Verse 10. It's all those who are crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around at the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. How long could that list have been? How long could that a list of just, you know, proclamation after proclamation of God's nature and character? They could have gone on forever. Why? God is eternal in his power and nature and wisdom and knowledge. He alone is worthy of that kind of adoration. What song did we sing right before this lesson? Glory and honor and dominion unto the lamb, unto the king. Then, verse 13, one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these? Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. First, who's worthy to stand? On your own? Nobody. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, anybody from any tribe, from any nation, all who are far off are welcome if they're willing to be washed by the blood of Christ. So when I think about the violence that was committed this weekend, because these people were of a different color, these people were of a different color and so he went out to kill them based upon their skin. Did Jesus die for white people only? For black people only? For Indians only? For Middle Eastern? For Jews only? He came and he died for who? All nations, every tongue, anybody who lives on any place of, in the earth. Is there any room knowing our own sins and shortcomings, for us to feel superior to anybody based on anything other than I am in Christ or I'm out of Christ. I'm either worthy because of the blood of Christ or I'm unworthy because I don't have the blood of Christ. Is there anything else we can compare ourselves to? Is there anybody outside of that that we can say, you know what, I'm better than because of the color of my skin or my job or how much money I make? It can't be found in the church. It shouldn't be found in the church. And yet the church needs to stand as a beacon calling who shall come. Any and all are willing. Therefore, verse 15, and we're about done. They are before the throne of God, serve him day and night in his temple, he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun, shall, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is in the midst of the throne who will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear. Who are those who are found with white robes? You better be washed in the blood of the Lamb and you better be serving God day and night, in and out of his temple. Why? He is worthy. This morning, I want to invite you, if you're not a Christian, this world, the way that it is, and those who are in rule and authority, are not the way it is designed. Originally, God made all things and every living creature to be under whom? Under God, but we rebelled, right? We rebelled. Satan told Eve that you can be like God. When you see all the images of God, is there any of us who can be like him? Even later, when John sees an angel, and it's glorious, and he wants to fall down before the angel to worship, and the angel goes, whoa! 
You don't understand, me and you are the same, buddy. I'm not worthy of that kind of praise and worship. There's only one. And that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. They are one. They alone are worthy of praise and worship. They alone are in rule and authority. And guess what? If you're not a Christian, one day your knee will bow down before the King of Kings. I implore you to do that before that day comes. To bow down willingly. To bow down and when Jesus comes, he's not a thief, but he's a friend. And that's what he desires. But you must be washed in the blood. The Bible tells us for you to be washed in the blood, you must have your sins washed away in baptism. That is where we contact his blood. We are washed, we are buried with him, Romans chapter 6, and we rise and we walk in newness of life. But it's got to be done through faith, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you believe that? If you do, why not? Why not? Why not this morning? But if you're a Christian this morning, and for a moment, for a moment you look into this world, and you think, and you think to ask yourself, is God really in control? Think again. Because even the saints under the altar who have died and are before the throne of God are still worried about whom? Are still worried about those who are living on the earth, praying and crying up to God, how long, how long, how long? And that honestly, it's a worthy prayer. Lord, how long will you allow these things to happen? But what we need to understand is God has promised, I got it all under control. What do you need to worry about? Are you one who will stand with him? Are you one who will be washed in the blood, standing there with a white robe, being able to fall down before God into eternity and worshiping him forever? If not, why not? Maybe you're struggling this morning, but there's something in your life where you just, you need the prayers of the church. You need the prayers, right? And we know, and we're going to find out in the book of Revelation that prayers work. Prayers of the saints, especially when they come together and they build up, they build up to a point where God almost has to. It overflows. Revelation chapter 8 is going to show us. It's going to overflow where these prayers are going to find their way back and be answered. They may not be answered right away, but they will be answered. So if you are struggling this morning, there's a lot of faithful, righteous people in this room. And James tells us the prayer of a righteous man it accomplishes much. What about the prayer of an entire church, an entire collection of community who love God, love you, and won't just pray for you here and now, but will continue to pray for you? If there's anything that you need this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and sing.